Welcome, folks, to Family Health Center of Worcester. We are a federally qualified health center for 50 years. Federally qualified health centers have worked hard to ensure that anyone and everyone can have access to high quality care. We are thrilled this morning to welcome the governor, the lieutenant governor, the um, secretary, and the executive director want to welcome you all to, for joining us here. I uh, also want to recognize the mayor. Thank you, Mayor Petty, for joining us, and our committed staff and board of directors. So we in community health centers have always believed in access to health care. We feel it's a bit of a shame that it took a pandemic for others to realize that it's in our best interest that my neighbor has good health care. But we welcome the moment and we welcome the recognition. I was talking with my wife, Lisa, yesterday and she said, so the governor's coming, what are you gonna say? And I said, well, it's really rather simple. These folks are true public servants. They deliver for us. She and I, we've had experience navigating vulnerable loved ones through the healthcare system. And there's a chasm that occurs between good intention and committed action. Uh, we'll sometimes say nobody does their job. The fact of the matter is that these leaders, they've done their job. They have shown up. In our darkest hour, when the pandemic uh, first broke open, they went to work and pulled out all the stops. And through policy and through financing and through technical assistance and through leadership and inspiration, they made sure that nobody was left uncovered and that people had access to important health care in the midst of, of all of the craziness. They showed up. They made sure that nobody was left behind. And it turns out that this has been in place for more than a year. Fifteen years ago, a forward-thinking set of leaders in Massachusetts recognized that it is in our best interest that my neighbor has health care and worked to expand health care in Massachusetts, being a leader in the nation for, uh, for high-quality care, access to high-quality care. And so we're grateful to you, uh, uh, Executive Director Gutierrez, and your team, to you, Governor Baker, to you, uh, Secretary Sutters, uh, Lieutenant Governor Polito, we love the fact that you show up and you make sure that we are forward thinking, we're walking our talk, and we're ensuring that everybody is safe. I want to acknowledge that we at the Health Center have been committed to this for 49 years, that we have been working to ensure access and equity and making sure that anyone and everyone who wants health care can, can achieve it. And it's been largely on the, the shoulders of our committed board of directors, our volunteers, and our staff. They show up every day, and they make sure that anybody who needs what they need gets what they need. And I am eternally grateful for that. I'm proud that we have committed partners at the state level and that they show up and give us what we need to make sure that everyone has what they need. Proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. Proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with our committed partners at the city level, in the community level. And I just want to say thank you. And, and with that, Governor Baker, I give you uh, the podium. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> well, thank you, Lewis. And to you and the team here, I just want to say thanks for opening up the doors and giving us a chance to come out and spend some time. But, but to you and to and to your board chair, Linda Rowe, and the rest of the team, what I would really say is thanks for everything you've done over the course of many years, but especially 
the work you've done and the, and the load you've carried over the course of the past year as we've been dealing with this pandemic. We're here today specifically to talk about the work that we've been doing to ensure that our health centers are well positioned to play a key role in the vaccine rollout. We're also here to mark the 15th anniversary of the signing of bipartisan health care reform legislation here in Massachusetts, a landmark law that created the Health Connector, which is now working with partners like Family Health Center to get people insured and keep our communities healthy. And um, I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute, but first I want to walk through my daily update on COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and vaccines. Yesterday, the Department of Public Health reported 1,800 new COVID-19 cases in Massachusetts. About 86,000 molecular tests were reported in total. Over 20 million tests have been conducted here in Massachusetts. In Worcester, here at the Family Health Center, uh, we've been very appreciative of the work they've done to get community members access to testing throughout the test site that's been located here since last spring. And even as we distribute vaccines, and I can't make this point enough, testing continues to be, remain a critical part of how we fight COVID. It helps us and helps you, the public and individuals, identify cases, work on isolation, find ways to support people as they deal with COVID in their own particular circumstances and trace positive cases so that we can continue to slow the spread. I'm pleased to say that we remain a national leader with respect to our testing output. Since the start of the pandemic, Massachusetts has completed more COVID tests per capita than virtually every other state in the country. And our testing continues to be relatively high relative to where it was back at the end of last year. And I want to thank the team here in Worcester for being part of that testing success. With respect to the rest of our metrics, about 698 patients are in the hospital for COVID and 172 are in the ICU. We've seen hospitalizations drop by about 10% since the beginning of March and report between roughly 1,000 and 2,000 new cases of COVID each day for the past several weeks. New cases have declined a little bit over the course of the past few days. On vaccines, over 4.5 million total doses have been administered to people across the Commonwealth, and more than 1.7 million people in Massachusetts are now fully vaccinated. We remain one of the top vaccine performers in the country on almost every key national metric, and we are the top state in both first and total doses administered among states that have more than 5 million people. We are also the first state with at least 5 million people to deliver a dose to over half our entire adult population. And I fully expect that at some point later this week, what do you think? We'll, we'll, we'll pass 2 million people in Massachusetts fully vaccinated. We will this week. We will this week. You heard it. You heard it right there. <laughs> Center of Gravity spoke. Um, and we continue to lead all states with more than 5 million people when it comes to our percentage of our adult population that's gotten a first dose with 53%, and we're fifth among all states for the percent of the adult population that's had a first dose. And as I've said many times, and I will continue to say, we have the infrastructure to administer a lot more vaccine than we've actually got. But unfortunately, uh, we've been told by the federal government that shipments, especially with respect to the J&J &J vaccine, will be much lower this week after we received a one-time increase last week. We continue to hope that the federal government's increases with regard to vaccine supply generally and especially with respect to J&J &J, get resolved and that the supply numbers, uh, not just here in Massachusetts but around the rest of the country, get to the point where they can actually meet demand. And when they do, we will quickly be able to get those doses into people's arms as we have been for the past month or so. One week from today, on April 19th, Patriots Day, we'll open vaccine eligibility to everybody, providing vaccine access to all individuals 16 and older who live, work, or study here in Massachusetts. I want to start this by saying how grateful we are that so many eligible residents in Massachusetts have signed up and gotten vaccinated so far. And we would encourage everybody uh, who will be eligible to sign up and schedule a vaccine when they are eligible. The vaccine saves lives. And if there's any doubt in anybody's mind about that, they should take a look at the success that vaccinating 
older Americans has had on older American case counts and older American hospitalizations. They have plunged dramatically since we began vaccinating senior citizens here in the U.S. back at the end of December. Our pre-registration system connects to hundreds of thousands of people with appointments at mass vac sites and also some regional collaborative sites, and there'll be more regional collaborative sites and others to be added throughout the month. That's in addition to the hundreds of other sites that exist across the Commonwealth, including community health centers in every region of Massachusetts like this one here, and so many of the other folks who are helping us deliver vaccines in disproportionately affected communities. Throughout the pandemic, our administrations worked closely with community health centers to both support them on their testing initiatives as well as on their care delivery initiatives and to help keep their communities safe and healthy. These places not only know the neighborhoods they serve, their neighbors know them. They are trusted by the residents in their community and they often play a key role in getting vulnerable communities access to care. In total, community health centers here in Massachusetts have administered over 300,000 doses, making them one of the top five types of providers here in the Commonwealth. The federal government's also recognized the importance of community health centers, and they've continued to increase the number of doses that they make available to these organizations week over week. And as we move through the vaccine rollout, community health centers are going to continue to play a critical role in vaccinating both their patients and other residents in their coverage areas. Family Health Center here in Worcester has been vaccinating their patients for the past several weeks, and soon they'll begin to vaccinate the broader community as well as supply increases, because supply is going to increase. Yes. <laughs> They've also played our community health center partners critical roles making connections between larger hospital systems and smaller community and faith-based organizations in their neighborhoods. And that's made a big difference with respect to both outreach, understanding, and delivery of vaccines across many communities in Massachusetts. And like many aspects of COVID, vaccine storage is a challenging issue, especially for some of the smaller community-based healthcare providers. That's why at the beginning of the process, we established a reimbursement rate for vaccines that was significantly higher for vaccines than it was at the national level under the Medicare rate to make it possible for community health centers and others to administer the vaccine to their most vulnerable populations. And we're pleased and proud that from the beginning, Massachusetts was focused on making it possible for these neighborhood-based providers to administer vaccine to members in their community. Community health centers also play a key role to make sure that people have access to insurance coverage. The Family Health Center here in Worcester is one of hundreds of community-based organizations across the Commonwealth that work with the Health Connectors Navigator program to get residents in their neighborhoods insured. Through ins though insurance isn't necessary to get the COVID vaccine, it certainly makes a difference with respect to all other aspects associated with health care. And we're proud that Massachusetts has one of the highest insurance rates in the country. I can't imagine anybody who's got a higher one, Professor, at 97% of our residents covered. The access to health insurance here makes our communities and our families healthier and ensures everyone can access the care they need when they need it. As I said in my opening remarks, today is the 15th year anniversary of the passage of the health care reform bill here in the Commonwealth. The law made Massachusetts a national leader in ensuring access to health insurance and has helped sustain us as one of the healthiest states in the nation ever since. It created the Health Connector, which has played a key role in helping people sign up for quality, affordable health care coverage. And we're here today with Secretary Sutters and Health Connector Executive Director Luis Gutierrez to share some reminders about the Health Connector's work to get people covered and to keep them covered. And I also want to say, um, I remember working with then State Representative John McDonough, who's standing over here to the side, um, on what I would describe as um, the screen pass that got us within the goal line, or close to the goal line associated with getting everybody covered back in the mid-1990s. And it made it, I think, a lot easier to get the final leg of that process accomplished several years later. And John, you were a real architect of many of the most important pieces associated with access here in the Commonwealth. I'm not exactly sure why you're here with us today. I'm thrilled that you are. Lewis invited you. 
<laughs> Did you? Good for you, Lewis. Okay. And, uh, and I just want to say how much we appreciate all the work you've done and the, uh, and the, the, the sort of blend, blend, blending together of um, just real serious smarts about this stuff with an ability to understand politically how it all plays out. Um, and I really enjoyed the time I spent working with you way back in the day, in the 1990s. Um, let me close with, by the way, I also want to give Lewis a big high five. Um, he walked into a pretty difficult situation at the Health Connector when we took office back in 2015. Um, and he not only dealt with it, he dealt with it in a relatively short period of time. There weren't a heck of a lot of hiccups along the way. And this connector here in Massachusetts, I would argue, is among the most successful, if not the most successful, in providing access to coverage for people here in the Commonwealth. And that's been borne out by the number of people who've accessed coverage through the connector and stayed there because they really liked and enjoyed the products that they had over the course of the past several years. Um, I do think we will at some point emerge from the pandemic and look ahead, and we'll continue to pri prioritize efforts to build healthier communities. But we will start with, in many respects, one of the healthiest community-based care delivery systems you're going to find anywhere in the country. Not only do we have some of the best hospitals in the world, which we talk about a lot, we're incredibly lucky to have a really strong network of community-based providers like this one here in Worcester and around the rest of the Commonwealth who are on the front lines every day solving problems, helping neighbors, and making sure that Massachusetts does live up to the commitment we made to make sure everybody in Massachusetts has access to health care. And with that said, I will turn it over to the Lieutenant Governor. Good morning. It's great to be here in the city of Worcester. It's great to be here at the Family Health Center uh, with Lewis Brady and his amazing team. It was great to say hello and just mostly for us to say how much we appreciate your team of professionals here who are truly dedicated to the health and well-being of our neighbors here. It's also great to be here on the 15th anniversary and to see the bookends involved in uh, the Health Connector, which we are so proud of here in the Commonwealth. And of course, it's great to be here with my colleague and friend, Mayor Petty. Uh, it gives me personal pleasure to say how proud we are of your efforts uh, over the course of this past year. Thank you for your leadership and your hard work, uh, along with Manager Ed Augustus and the, and the council members. Thank you. As the governor mentioned, community health centers like this are a key part of our vaccine distribution infrastructure. Massachusetts remains a national leader in vaccinations. We lead the nation in first doses and total doses among large states with 5 million people or more, states like ours. We also have been successful at vaccinating those most vulnerable to the virus, including penetrating deeply the age over 75, where we are close to 84% at that, at that rate. To make uh, this uh, progress, we've relied on a diverse group of vaccine providers, including community health centers like this, hospitals, regional collaboratives, mass vac sites, pharmacies, and more. That approach is evident here in Worcester County, where residents have a wide range of options to get vaccinated. In addition to community health centers like this one, which will soon be vaccinating uh, the broader community, there are a number of local sites and vaccination efforts happening uh, as we speak. Uh, we have five regional collaboratives in uh, Worcester County, starting in the north part of the county, with Haywood Hospital and Gardner partnering with local boards of health. In the southern part of our county, Harrington Hospital and Southbridge partnering with their board of health. Rutland is leading a, a regional collaborative, Uxbridge as well. And here in Worcester itself, the city is working with the Commonwealth Medicine at Saint, and St. Vincent's Hospital at Worcester State University as a regional collaborative. Uh, these are great, uh, obviously, partnerships. Uh, these collaborations are key. When you have hospitals and local officials working together, uh, they obviously have spanned over a, a large geographic area here in central Massachusetts uh, to have high capacity uh, you know, throughput and make it efficient and make it comfortable for residents to be able to access the vaccine. I also want to give uh, a nod to our friends at UMass, uh, their new name, uh, UMass uh, Health, UMass Memorial Health, and uh, the efforts that, that Eric Dixon and his team have uh, deployed, including 
the mobile vaccination options here in the community. Uh, their mobile vaccination units have completed about 2,200 vaccinations with about 1,700 being first doses. So they're doing really uh, great with the mobile vaccination program. And, you know, getting into the, the grassroots organizations, uh, making sure that people who either might be hesitant, might be homebound, or might not be sure, uh, figure out a way to make it easy and go to them. Uh, they're focusing on communities of color uh, who face uh, linguistic, technological, or other barriers to vaccination, and they're breaking all those barriers down and getting the vaccine out. Uh, so we are very grateful to all of our friends here, uh, including uh, UMass Memorial, the city of Worcester. Uh, you continue to make us proud, and you continue uh, to display a high degree of dedication and energy uh, toward this effort, and we are, are very appreciative to highlight that today. With that, I'll now turn it over to Secretary Sutters. So we'll see how we do this without our glasses. <laughs> Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Lou, Lewis, um, it's always great to be back at the Worcester Family Health Center, and I'm glad the governor gave a shout out to uh, Professor John McDonough who's been a longtime friend and collaborator, and I'm always grateful for the, the advice that you, you give, whether I ask it or not. Um, the pandemic has made one thing very clear. We can't, always we can't always predict what health risks we might face, individually or collectively. Throughout the pandemic, our healthcare system has never been overwhelmed in responding to the health needs of our residents during COVID. Our health system wasn't overwhelmed because of our strong history and commitment to health care in Massachusetts. As a result, Massachusetts is a national leader. We have the nation's highest rate of health coverage, 97%, and has held this nation-leading position in health coverage for well over a decade. The Massachusetts Health Connector has maintained the lowest average premiums of any exchange market in the nation since 2017. And our state exchange, I agree with the governor, is among the most robust, if not the strongest, health insurance marketplace in the country, with nine medical carriers participating and 59 health coverage products offered. In 2006, prior to the passage of our state's health care reform, 86% of adults were insured and only 75% of lower income residents were covered. Within two years after the law's enactment, the overall insurance rate increased to 90, 95%. The most dramatic increase was for individuals who were lower income. Their insurance coverage climbed to more than 92%. Over the last 15 years, we've seen what having health insurance can do for the well-being of our residents. For many, it relieves some of the worries about even whether to seek care or not. Our health connector is strong under the leadership of Luis Gutierrez and the team that he's assembled. It's an honor to chair the connector's board. And people in Massachusetts use their health care. Immediately after reform was passed 15 years ago, unmet need for care declined 28%. These numbers have shown that health care coverage is critical to ensuring quality of life for all of our residents. Of course, it's impossible to talk about quality of life and health care with without coming back to COVID-19 and the efforts to get vaccines distributed equitably across all of our communities so we can get closer to return to return to our normal lives. As the governor indicated, everyone aged 16 and older will become eligible as of next Monday, Patriot's Day, how fitting. To ensure equitable access of the vaccine, particularly among some of our most vulnerable, the Commonwealth Vaccine Equity Initiative is working to increase awareness and empower individuals to accept vaccine when it's their turn. And I do wanna give a shout out to the city of Worcester and the work. So I want to acknowledge some of those equity efforts that our teams are making right here in Worcester. Worcester and Worcester-based organizations have received a total of just under $500,000 so far. The funding supports local boards of health to respond to COVID-19 pandemic. It also leverages community and faith-based organizations to do outreach and education to minimize the spread of COVID-19 and increase vaccination confidence in our BIPOC and Latinx residents. This week, we have over 40 canvassers, boots on the ground, in concert with the Worcester Interfaith Group 
and supporting the efforts of the Southeast Asian Coalition and Latino Education Institute to get out our message in multiple languages, trust the facts, get the vax. We know that there are many other ongoing health challenges facing our communities and that health care coverage is a critical piece. For those 3% of the Commonwealth residents don't yet have coverage, that 3% that Lewis continues to try to get to be zero, please visit the Health Connector website or contact a local community health center who can help you get covered. And the Family Health Center here does a fabulous job in that. About three quarters of our uninsured residents are eligible for zero or low dollar health coverage. As a result of the American Rescue Plan, even more people are likely to qualify. So there's no better time than now. And enrollment will be open through July. And for those people already enrolled through the Health Connector, two-thirds will see their premiums go down starting in May. I want to thank you again, Lou, and the rest of the Worcester Family Health Center team for having us here today, and thank you for the valuable health care work you provide to the residents of Greater Worcester. And now I'm going to turn the mic over to Louis Gutierrez, the Health Connector Executive Director, but there's one more anniversary today. It was one year ago today that the Community Tracing Collaborative started with the very first contacts in Massachusetts and under the leadership of Lewis and the Community Tracing Collaborative, which is the Department of Public Health and par uh, Partners in Health, we have provided supports and isolation support for more than 590,000 people in Massachusetts. With that, I'll turn it over to Lewis. Good afternoon. And on behalf of the Massachusetts Health Connector Authority, we are thrilled to celebrate 15 years of commitment to affordable health coverage in Massachusetts. The Baker administration has steadfastly supported these reform efforts for over one third of that journey. We depend on community partners such as Family Health Center of Worcester, which is not only a major provider of frontline care to thousands of Worcester residents, but it also helps thousands understand and apply for health insurance. And as the Secretary said, with the passage of the American Rescue Plan, this is the best time ever to obtain health insurance in Massachusetts. Applicants seeking coverage can come to Family Health Center or to the Health Connectors website at www dot mahealthconnector.org or find and find other community assisters that may be closer to them and also as the secretary said we have open enrollment until July 23rd in April and May this month and next current health connector members will get updated information about their health premium amounts most of these members will see even lower premiums. Currently unsubsidized members may also newly qualify for financial assistance and will be informed of the steps to take to obtain it. Finally, people who have been out of work and on unemployment income in 2021 will be able to obtain connector plans with no premium payments starting in July. I want to thank Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, Secretary Sutters, and the Health Connector Board, leading community lights like Professor McDonough, and our congressional and legislative leadership for their unwavering support for affordable health coverage in the Commonwealth. And thank you to the Family Health Center for your work with our Connector members and for hosting us all today. Thank you. Questions? I haven't heard anything past that, have you? No. Yeah. 
We're, um, we have a call tomorrow, and hopefully they'll shed a little more light on what the plan is for uh, the J&J &J vaccine after the this week and next. Um, obviously, you go from 100,000 doses, which created all kinds of opportunities to uh, to use that one dose in a variety of strategic ways, to the 12,000 to four. It makes it really hard to create a sustainable program with this. And what I think all of us are hoping happens is that we can get into, as a country, the same kind of rhythm on the one-dose J&J &J that we've been in for about a month now on Moderna and Pfizer. And and J&J, &J, obviously, the fact that it's one dose is incredibly important just in terms of time, how fast you can get people fully vaccinated relative to the two-dose Pfizer and Moderna um, vaccines. But the other thing is um, it puts one more tool in the toolbox, one more available uh, vaccine, and it makes it possible to really bump the numbers. I, I don't know if you guys followed the numbers, but when we had 100,000 J&J vaccines, we got over 100,000 doses a week, excuse me, a day going on here in the Commonwealth. And, and I think the... Um, I think the real possibility here, if the, if the feds can amp the supply, is we've proven we have tons of capacity to actually absorb it. How is this going to slow you down, though? I mean, uh, Secretary, we're, 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 we're getting there, and I imagine you have benchmarks in your head about where you want to be for a third of the population, half the population. Does this slow you down because it's a window? Well, I think the biggest challenge is just getting um, onto some sort of a consistent you know, if the number is going to be 40,000 a week or 30,000 a week or 60,000 a week, whatever the number is going to be, just <laughs> stay there. So, and, and give us, early on when we were talking about Pfizer and Moderna, we talked a lot about visibility, right? About if you can get three or four weeks of uh, visibility into this, you can create programs around that. And the programs you create around that can be sustained. And I think what we would like I'm speaking for Massachusetts, but I've talked to other governors as well. The thing we'd really like is the same sort of predictability and visibility into the J and J vaccine that we've had into uh, that we've had into Moderna and Pfizer. I don't think. I mean, you know, we've managed to stay pretty close to the to the timelines and the deadlines that we set up back in November as we've rolled through these phased processes and getting open to everybody by April 19th is pretty consistent with what we said back in December about when we thought we would be there. And I've said several times that, you know, supply um, will be an issue, but I do believe that if the supply is there, you know, by the time we get to Memorial Day, a significant number of people in Massachusetts will have been vaccinated. Governor, are these issues with Johnson and Johnson? Uh, you have a lot of health metrics, but the, uh, single, the number of deaths, single digits now, when would you consider that uh, the maybe doing the mask, losing the mask mandate like outdoors, going back to that, just to give people some sort of sense of when that might come out. Well, we follow the data pretty closely, and as you all know, the data tends to be a little unpredictable. So, um, so I'm hesitant to give a date on something like as significant as, as changing some of our fundamental um, rules and guidelines that I believe have made a big positive difference here in Massachusetts. What I would say is that if the supply's there and we get to the, we have like 4 million people we want to get vaccinated at least, right? Well, that's our next, yeah. <laughs> let's see, let's see if the supply gets there and we get those people vaccinated as quickly as we possibly can. Then we can start talking about other stuff. Well, you know, I'm not sure if I'm able to say what it would look like. We'd be like, we go back to, because we had the masks on indoors, you know, and then that six feet, you know, Will we go back to being outside, keep your space, and you don't have to wear I think a lot of this is going to depend on both guidance we get from the feds, how fast we are able to vaccinate people, and um, and how big a deal these variants are in not just here in Massachusetts and in the Northeast, but around the country generally. Governor, are these issues with Johnson & Johnson a, a speed bump, or is this a sign of a more serious problem that's going to hurt us down the road? And also, are people going to lose faith in Johnson & Johnson because... Yeah, I mean, about 120,000 people in Massachusetts have gotten the J&J &J vaccine. Um, and overall, outside of the occasional issues you have for some people with respect to how they respond to the, would, would have responded to any vaccine, um, I mean, the feedback on it has been 
uh, been very good. I'm not worried about J&J. &J. I, I like the idea of a one dose because I think especially for a lot of the communities folks like Lou and his team serve, a one dose is a terrific way uh, to meet people where they are and to get them vaccinated and, you know, to sort of close the loop on it. And it doesn't require them to go somewhere twice. It doesn't require us to get them to go somewhere twice. It doesn't require us to create a second appointment at some point. I mean, if you, the beauty of the, of the one dose on J&J &J is, you know, you can go to senior centers and senior housing and community centers and places like that and turn it into almost an event and maybe get a bunch of people who might be a little hesitant to choose to get vaccinated because they see their neighbor getting vaccinated or their friend or the person they play cards with or whatever it might be. And, um, and that to me is where the real power to some extent of, of the J&J &J vaccine can come from. I think the, we have been told that the incident in Baltimore had a lot to do with um, why we went from here to here. And, uh, and I, I will know a lot more tomorrow about what the sort of medium term is going to look like with respect to catching up. But I, I, I can't answer that question today because I just don't know. The governor of Michigan is suggesting that states with a surplus of vaccine ship those to states that are having a shortfall. Something like what happened with ventilators. Would you, would you support that? Um, I don't think you're going to find a lot of states where people are going to say they have a quote unquote surplus. Um, we just see stories, and it's all stories about, you know, in Texas, for example, I think there were 100,000. They were putting out the word, hey, we've got a bunch of shots. Come, come get them to, to people to get vaccinated. If you look at the size of the numbers that are involved here, um, I mean, we, we're a national leader among big states, right? And this week, hopefully, we'll have fully vaxxed 2 million people. Um, we have at least that many and probably more especially once we get into the under the under 16 population that need to get vaccinated. And I'd be hesitant to say that anything other than the process the feds are currently using, which is basically population driven, would make sense at this point in time. It may be you get some point down the road and you really do start to see states that get to the point where, you know, they are quote unquote semi semi or fully vaccinated where you might make a decision at that point. Um, to reallocate resources, but I can't see doing that until you get a lot farther down the... I mean, remember, April 19th is really going to be when, for the first time, everybody is going to be eligible. And you're talking about really big numbers there across all 50 states. Um, I think the... I, I think we ought to let that, let that run for a while and, and see where we are. And if we ever do get to the point where you know, that date we were told once upon a time would be here by February, which was more supply than demand. Um, at that point in time, I could see starting to do something like that. But I think at this point, the goal should be pedal the metal everywhere until you get to the point where a lot more people are vaccinated. Governor, Governor my question is about that. April 19th. Um, given the fact that we're going to have millions more in line, um, are you concerned about stress on the website, concerned about long waits before people get that? Google Cloud text. I think part of that's going to depend a little on supply. I hate to keep coming back to that. I'm not worried about the website. Um, that's not fair. I'm always worried about the website. But <laughs> we have been assured that it won't be a problem, and they've run some pretty heavy stress tests on it. Um, but I think, the, uh, I think it's likely that uh, how long people are going to need to wait to get vaccinated is going to be 100% a function of supply. I mean, if there is suddenly... Let's suppose we have this conversation tomorrow or even next week with the feds about the run rate on Johnson & Johnson, and they basically say it's going to be consistent with where it was before the thing in Baltimore happened. You would see a significant increase in, uh, in vaccination capability everywhere, including here, which would have a real impact on how soon people will get appointments. Last question. So you're that, that you're expecting less and that that coincides with when everybody becomes eligible. How is that going to affect things on Patriots Day? Well, no, keep in mind that the folks who are going to be eligible on the 19th, right, um, that's kind of the beginning of that process. A lot of the slots that week are going to be booked by people who are coming back for second doses who were previously eligible, probably half of those slots will be booked that way. So, I mean, the thing about the two doses is not only does it take longer, six to eight weeks to get somebody fully vaccinated instead of two, 
which is what it takes with the single dose. But it's also a capacity constraint because once people get dosed the first time, they're coming back three or four weeks later. So you literally, you know, the, <laughs> the way this has worked from the beginning has been you, you first dose for three weeks and then your first dose and second dosing from that point forward. So J and J until you get to the end of everybody who gets first dosed and then you have three, a three week tail or a four week tail where the people who had only been first dosed then get second dosed. The thing about J and J is you lay it on top of that and it creates a ton of new capacity and that's I think the thing we're waiting for. So Thanks everybody. Well, I think, I, generally speaking, that's been about the time frame uh, for most folks since we started doing the phased, um, the phased rollout. It's been about two or three weeks, depending upon, you know, what group you're in, when you register, you know, how, wh where you live, what other opportunities might be available to you. Remember, we're still going to see significant doses, very significant doses, going into the federal government's number one distribution channel which are the retail pharmacies, okay? So, you know, on April 19th, when this whole thing opens up and people pre-register, you're still going to have significant portions of the population who are going to hear from their doctor's office, or they're going to get an appointment at a CVS, or they're going to come to a community health center, or they're going to go um, to a, a regional collaborative that's not part of the pre-registration site, and you're going to continue to see people book up that way. And as, and as the feds have been pushing doses into the retail pharmacy chain, uh, re retail pharmacy chains, that has gone from, you know, 50 or 60 participating perform pharmacies. How many pharmacies do we have now? 500. 500. Yeah, I mean, it's like literally a 10x growth since they started doing this. And, um, and I think a lot of people end up getting their, their shots in those sites, which is fine with me. I don't care where they go, just as long as they get one. Thanks, everybody. No. But can you give us anything more than significant? Tell me what the supply looks like and how much J and J we have. I mean, you know, the one dose is a really big deal in the context of how long it takes for somebody to get fully vaccinated. I can't answer that question. Governor, can you uh, tell us about the situation of the registry of motor vehicles? How concerned are you about this software glitch or the, the rating of the site run by Atlas? Well, the first thing I'd say is that. Um, to the best of our knowledge, and we've spent a lot of time with the vendor on this, nobody's information has ended up anywhere in the public domain. And I think that's really important. The second thing I would say uh, is we fully expect the vendor um, to, uh, to find a way to compensate many of the folks uh, at the dealer and the service station level have been horribly inconvenienced by this. Um, and the, the third thing I would say is that you know, the conversations between the dealers and the, and the Commonwealth and the vendor, not just here in Massachusetts, but in the other states, and there are many, that rely on this vendor to do this work, um, have been daily. And it's our expectation that by the end of the week, uh, this needs to be solved. Right. And, and we, have, we have made clear to law enforcement um, across the Commonwealth that they shouldn't be writing tickets to people um, associated with this. And they have made clear to us they're not going to, and which I think is, exactly, yeah. Can I ask Mr. Brady a question? Yeah. Early on in this, as, as the vaccine started to come out, they were given more to the mass vaccination sites than the places like this. Obviously that's changed. Was there frustration on your part early on that you couldn't get vaccine and how have you, how do you view the process as it's evolved and where we are today? We were frustrated for our communities. We felt that it's important that our folks have access to this vaccine if we're going to get any traction on rebuffing the pandemic. Our folks have uh, very public facing jobs, jobs that you can't zoom into. They have to make very difficult choices and access to the vaccine is, is critical for our society in this particular domain if we're going to make any, any real traction on it. So we had some frustration. We are very pleased that we are now able to access the federal supply. And that's a, a critical component, the, the supply chain opening up. The other piece is we have been a 
a challenged infrastructure. We are a community-based organization that has done a lot with a little, and we've been able to rely on the state. Uh, and they have provided funding for uh, the Mass League to support the health center's build-out infrastructure. They have provided us with additional technical assistance, and so we expect our supply and our infrastructure to grow and to be able to partner with uh, local folks like the city to, to provide that vaccine equity uh, that we would uh, that that we're committed to. Thank you. Thank you.